good, beloved. It's Tuesdays with Tawana. And I am on location on today. Good to see you. Good to be in the building. Missed you on last week. So we're going to make up for some lost time. I am Dr. Tad, your host and your curator for Tuesdays with Tawana. This is the space and the place where we come together to build community one episode at a time. We come together to talk about what brings us joy, what frustrates us, what is going on in our societies and within our personal selves and all of that to build community. Hey, my sister. Yes. I just missed, you know, last week, you know, sometimes, not sometimes, you must practice what you preach. And I needed to rest, rest my mind, my body, my soul, um, knowing that the month of October uh, tends to be a very busy month for me. Hey, what's up, Alan? Good to see you. Blessings to you, beloved. Um, October tends to be a very busy month, and I needed a minute, so I took a break last week. I went on a staycation over the weekend and just spent time around the water because water gives me life, and I am so grateful. So we're having a Where's Waldo moment. Um, where is Dr. Tad? I'm on location at a secret location. Can't tell you, uh, can't share the details, but know that I am safe and I am in a beautiful space and have some time to chop it up with you for a little while before we, uh, I, <laughs> take care of business um, with some beloveds. So um, yeah, so let's get it popping because this half an hour just goes by extremely fast. So, um, of course, you know, it's, it's October. October comes with a lot of emotion, reflection, compassion, empathy, action, a lot of mistakes, a lot of missteps. So it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month and Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And I represent both. I am diagnosed with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer in active treatment. And I am a domestic violence survivor, both in which I am thriving because of community, because of my love for self, because of the care that I, uh, the, the care that I take for myself and for others, uh, I tell my story so that someone can take pieces away from it and learn and be encouraged and be empowered, whether you are surviving breast cancer or mourning the loss of a loved one, or a caregiver, family, whatever it is, it's creating this sacred space for us to get together and talk about it. Because as you see, our theme or our topic for today is stop the violence and the silence. Tanisha says that, uh, can I petition for 45 minutes? TWT 30 minutes isn't long enough for your beauty, grace, intellect, and magic. Thank you, beloved. I, takes one to know one, for sure. Hey, brother. Good to see you. Glad you are in the building on today. So for those of you who may be joining or listening later for the first time or watching later for the first time, um, what I do is, you know, I am not speaking for the full 30 minutes, aka 45 minutes, 
but um, you put comments in the chat and I insert your voice into this narrative because I can't build community alone. I, I need... I need others. I need other beloveds. We need each other. We need beloveds in order to build community, to heal in community, to combat the systemic ills, to combat d domestic violence. And I guess combat might not be the most appropriate word to use when we're talking about domestic violence, because sometimes our language can be a bit abusive and a bit triggering to uh, domestic violence survivors, like fighting for my life. That is a literal statement for some folk, some beloveds. And, you know, um, yeah. So just being mindful and, and, and being aware of the language that we use and using October to plant those seeds to uh, expand our minds and expand our uh, empathetic and compassionate language when we are speaking about domestic violence in particular. I choose during this month to talk about domestic violence because um, we find that uh, breast cancer for some, for many, in my experience and what I notice, it's much easier to talk about because it is environmental or it's hereditary or it even it may be diet but we you know the guilt and the shame doesn't really come forth in relation to domestic violence um you know growing up in in my community I identify as a black woman and grew up in a black and brown neighborhood. And I remember when we wouldn't even say the word cancer, let alone have these advocacy groups um, coming together to talk about cancer and to talk about how it's adversely impacting black and brown beloveds, specifically breast cancer, specifically black women, because 41% of black women, 40 to 41%, depending on what um, platform you're looking at that has factual numbers because Google is great and everything, but not everything you see um, you can believe and not everything you read is true. But 41%, 40% of black women die at higher rates as compared to white women when it comes to breast cancer. Why is that? Because of the lack of access, because of lack of early detection, because of violence that happens in the medical field, because doctors don't listen. Some doctors don't listen to us. They don't listen to our pain and our concerns. Or if someone has um, Medicaid, it becomes a classist uh, situation where you know, I don't want to do this test or Medicaid denies this PET scan and the list goes on and on with breast cancer. So it tends to be a bit more palatable to talk about, if you will. Um, it's not, for me, in my experience and embodying or living both experiences, um, Many people will call me to talk about breast cancer and fewer people to call, will call me to talk about or come and present about domestic violence. I have one beautiful group that th two to three times a year I am presenting for their certification class for, for those who um, are becoming domestic violence advocates and activists. And I do a religion piece um, religion and domestic violence. Um, and they call me every time. So I have a, a standing gig, if you will, to offer um, what it looks like and the abuse that happens in, in religions and in congregations and not just churches. We're not just talking about Christianity, but in organized religion in general. And in our scriptures, we find often you know, this horrific language that refers to rape and murder and wars and abuse and um, misogynoir, which is the disdain for black women. We find all of that in the sacred text. And yet we are called 
um, when we're in a congregational setting and there's someone sitting there or a couple sitting there who is in an intimate partner, violent relationship, and we are just preaching right over them. Like we are further, um, not really supporting, but what we don't say, the silence is actually advocating for and increasing the shame and the guilt that comes along with um, being a, a victim of domestic violence or one who is on the receiving end of the violence. And we focus a lot on those who are on the receiving end versus those who are actually the abusers or perpetrators. And that has always been a point of contention for me and very frustrating for me because it looks really good on paper when um, a, you know, a domestic violence uh, advocacy group, they'll list uh, a, a 10 step safety plan, They'll have support groups. Um, they people um, organizations have shelters, but when you start to humanize all of that and actually humanize the experience, it is quite daunting and quite scary. So when people say shit like, "Why did you leave? That couldn't happen to me. Why did you stay?" Why didn't you just, you know, fight back and the list goes on and on and on? And then your answer is in the statistic and the newspapers and even things that aren't talked about. The numbers, one in four men, women and one in nine men, those statistics are skewed because you can't get accurate data when people aren't sharing their story because of the guilt and shame. So it's so important that we, in order to stop the violence, we got to end the silence. We have to take the power away from those perpetrators and abusers. We got to talk about it and unveil it and release it so that there's no guilt and shame. And there is a community of beloveds that can support those who are on the receiving end of the violence and be able to get them to safety. And not only get them to safety, but why is it that the one who is on the receiving end of the violence has to relocate, has to leave their children, has to go into deplorable shelters, um, there's no mental health or very little mental health services, um, all the changes and the onus then falls on the one on the receiving end while the perpetrator is still living in the home, still working, maybe charismatic, still, you know, the, the cream of the crop to the community, not knowing what goes on behind closed doors because usually domestic violence happens behind closed doors. And when you are out in public, this person is so wonderful and so charismatic and so intelligent and so bright, and you're just playing along because those are the good times. Those are the times where you feel safe so to speak, and because you don't want to say the wrong thing or say out loud, well, he ain't really that nice or she's not really that nice or they're not really that nice because they take me home and they beat me every night. Or there's a financial abuse where I my paycheck gets taken every week, every two weeks, every month, and I get a little allowance because I am not allowed to go anywhere or do anything. Um, my cell phone is monitored by my abusive partner or spiritually we go to church and you see the pastor even said, you got to obey and do whatever. And it, it further, um, it magnifies the, the power, if you will, because no one is speaking out, not no one, it's not enough people speaking out on a collective level about this this epidemic called domestic violence. Then you have um, emotional abuse and you have physical abuse. And when there's physical abuse, someone may call out sick from work until the bru bruises heal. Or the abuser is so smart enough to then make sure that the bruises don't show. So you'll wear long sleeves, you'll wear long pants or a long skirt or 
whatever and it you know it's not showing on your face but it is showing in in your heart and your emotions and physically so how do we then address this epidemic how do we get um large organizations um to really uh bring light and bring awareness to domestic violence in all the different facets and then how do we shift the narrative to then hold the abuser accountable versus um putting the responsibility um on the person who is receiving the abuse and i'll give you an example like the nfl um we read horror stories about the nfl players some players who are abusive or even go to jail or you know is blasted all over the newspaper and that's only a few i'm sure that's not everybody so why is it that in a sport or even in like the police department even in places where um their job is to naturally be um well police and nfl i'm not going to compare i'm going to use two different examples there for the nfl naturally be aggressive to be you know have this power and you know it's 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 a sport it's it's a sport that is very physical and very emotional and these things carry over it's not compartmentalized many times it's not compartmentalized it carries over into the home and the partner spouse ends up being the one to take the brunt of the abuse whether it's releasing or venting or somebody lost a game or they just have this power this mindset of power and control and they want to cause harm and then remember that domestic violence is a cycle it's not necessarily a linear cycle but it's similar to a circle it can get a little messy and the lines may cross a bit but overall there is you know when things are going fine then the tension builds then the abuse happens then there's a, an apology and then we keep going through this over and over again and to add to that the reason why it's not cyclical or linear is because like financial abuse is ongoing there's really rarely ever a sorry that i'm giving you this little allowance it's always excuses or because i'm in charge and i have the power or spiritually there's no apology for using the scriptures to abuse so it that cycle doesn't work all the time in all instances it more most likely um works when you're talking about physical and um verbal abuse um overall and again i don't do blanket statements but i do make general statements where there is some semblance of commonality so i began to compare the nfl and police officers which i don't want to do because that that is not my intention so i use the example of the nfl why can't they have a sunday instead of wearing pink all of october which is a great thing i want it to happen because i'm you know i'm a black woman going into 7 years of surviving metastatic breast cancer i want the awareness out there i want to talk about it i want to tell my story i want people to be encouraged i want people to understand that they are healers i want people to understand that they have to define their healing and appreciate the moments and even when you can't do something then think about something that you can do even when you can no longer do something think about something that you are able to do and start you know using um positive affirmations and encouraging words to encourage yourself so you can live and not die at the hands of systemic ills so why is it that the nfl doesn't take one sunday out of the month and everybody wear purple it's just the, one of the similar reasons why um male or men pastors in particular don't preach about domestic violence because one um the power and control 
you're challenging the very power that you are benefiting from or it is happening in your own home. So you want to be very careful or they want to be very careful about what they preach because it might be too close to home. But then another example is police officers. They, they don't need to be aggressive and assertive and abusive and racist and murderers, but what they can do is channel that energy where they're supposed to protect and serve. So it would be great if they can protect and serve not only the community, but they can protect and serve their family and their spouses. But instead, the same shit that they do out in the streets where they're killing unarmed beloveds, they are um, incarcerating beloveds for minimal reasons where they shouldn't be incarcerated and then they go home and they do the same thing because in their minds once you keep repeating something it becomes a habit it becomes a part of who you are so now they go home and think that it is okay it is okay to treat their spouse the same way they treat beloveds in the street instead of protecting and serving and being servants to the community. And, you know, my beloved Courtney Anika, um, who is the Associate Director um, of Organizational Wellness with Soul to Soul Sisters, she has a beautiful, beautiful presentation on the police and how the police was started and how that same, um, mindset of enslaving folk and abusing folks who were enslaved is still carrying on um, to this day. We may not be considered enslaved, but racists think that we are less than or they de dehumanize us and demean us and marginalize us and oppress us. So the abuse is happening not only in our homes, but when we talk about domestic violence, think about the domestic violence that is happening here in this country where Unfortunately, there, there are times when we get an apology, but it's a bullshit apology because a real apology is naming what you have done and then changing the behavior, right? So in order for me to receive your apology, I need to see some changed behavior. I don't need you to tell me I'm sorry and we feel good in the moment and then you turn around and do the same thing. And then why is it so hard for women to leave or excuse me, beloveds to leave because this happens in um, men. For, men are also victims or receivers of abuse in non-binary femme relationships, um, gay, lesbians, transgender, queer... It happens to us more often, black beloveds, more often than any other group except in our indigenous First Nation beloveds. So when we think about, um, you know, where it's happening, like it's happening all around us, but, and, we got to hold on to, or at least take it piece by piece. Start with our communities, start with our homes, and then to our communities, and then to our outer communities, like our state, and then we can take it and bring it to a nationwide level. Until then, if we don't deal with the personal stuff, I can't give what I don't have, I can't teach what I don't know, um, so it's so important that we take care of home and make sure healing happens and, um, safety and protection and better responses to domestic violence, all of that. <laughs> and it's a lot. It's a lot. I, I... It's a lot, and I'm, I'm talking from personal experience, how it is a lot. A safety plan is great, but to implement that safety plan is, if you don't have a village, 
Like if I didn't have a place where I could move to and hide my car and have my classmates go with me everywhere so I didn't have to be by myself, if I didn't have people coming with me to the courthouse to witness, I was shamed by the judge, I was shamed by the court clerks. You, you gotta be ready. You gotta be armored up. You gotta be girded up. You need community. So how do we get community to stop being silent about this and stop being so negative and so demeaning and so degrading to people who are in domestic violence relation, violent relationships? We gotta stop the violence and in order to stop the violence, we gotta end the silence. So every single October, every day I'm on TikTok with a daily-ish freebie dropping nuggets about domestic violence awareness. And every Tuesday in October, I talk about domestic violence. Because if I talk about it, it'll bring awareness. And if you can be aware of it, then you can name it. And then if you can name it, you can fix it. And what do we say? Healing happens in community. It's not easy, but healing happens in community and domestic violence, healing from domestic violence, being safe from domestic violence, being protected from domestic violence, being able to still be with your family and your loved ones. All of that happens in community. So we as a community must learn a language that is different from blaming, further victimizing, gaslighting, doing all the things that make the person who is receiving the abuse shameful and not want to say anything. Because I, I don't have anyone to have my back. <laughs> I don't have anyone to support me or to protect me because that's another thing. It's important for all of us. When I keep the National Domestic Violence Hotline scrolling across the screen, it's not only for those who are in um, domestic violence uh, relationships, but it's for, for us as well to get information, to get language, that we need in order to support someone, to be present, the, the, the ministry of presence, of support, of seeing somebody and acknowledging like, this is not your fault. You, you, you don't deserve this. I don't care who you are, what you do, how you show up in the world. You do not deserve to be abused by anyone on any level. We don't, as the black diaspora, do not deserve to be abused by the systems that continue to abuse us, to kill us, mind, body, and spirit. We do not deserve it. We did not ask for it. it, it I don't care how much you like us or dislike us or you hate our divinity, you hate our creativity, you hate the fact that we are still here. When you keep trying to kill us, you keep trying to erase us. Now you're trying to erase our history, but we're going to keep coming. We're going to keep coming back. We're going to build our own libraries. We're going to build and use um, congregations and community organizations to make sure that our children are taught. This is when we build schools. This is when we build houses of worship. This is when we build communal spaces. This is when we build shared spaces so that we can get the word out and really not, and not wait for a system that wasn't designed for us to begin with to do the things that we need done in order to survive and thrive. Hey, Julie, good to see you as always. So this is the time when we are faced with this epidemic, it is time for us to respond as if we are responding to an academic, ep epidemic. We need to be serious. We need to come together. We need to name it. We got to face it. We got to fix it. 
We need to know about empathy, active listening, the ministry of presence, how to be safe, make sure these shelters are doing what they need to do holistically, that they are safe, that they are clean, that they are not kicking people out because they, they, they may have mental health challenges. We have an opportunity. We are in a crisis mode. And crisis, I learned in seminary, is a dangerous opportunity. So we have a dangerous opportunity to turn and spin this thing on its head where we hold the abuser and the perpetrator accountable. Now, what that looks like is communal accountability because I'll end with this, who do we call when we need help? I'm not calling the police because I'm either gonna die or be harmed by my abuser or I'm gonna be harmed and die at the hands of law enforcement. Pick and choose which one. That, that sucks that you have no one to go to for protection and safety and guidance and covering and understanding and building me up and filling me back up after I've been beat down for so long. I start to think less of myself start to think that I deserve this. I start to think that there's nothing, nobody else is going to want me. No one else will have me. No one else will want to be in relationship with me because I have all these scars. As a matter of fact, I have all these wounds because I can't even heal myself. So we got to do something, beloved, to come together and shift the narrative of domestic violence. For the rest of this month, we will have special guests come on and 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 we're going to keep talking about this. Um we're going to start a movement for the NFL to give me give me one Sunday. That's all I'm asking for. I really want the whole month. But I understand because I need breast cancer awareness to happen just as much as domestic violence awareness is happening. One should not be higher than the other because of societal perceptions of both epidemics, right? It's, it's, it's an epidemic when 41% of black women are dying at a higher rate than, than white women. So I hope that this was helpful. I hope that um, you will share this with beloveds because sometimes it's hard to get the message out because those who are in domestic violence relationships, their phones are screened, their computers are screened. So sometimes you got to take your beloved out to dinner and have a conversation and it all has to stay up here. It can't be written down. You can't take it in notes on a phone. You, you, you got to be real creative because you don't want to do anything that is going to cause further harm to the one that's being abused or cause harm to yourself. Like, why is Tawana in our business? I'm going to go holler at her because I know where she lives. I see her on social media all the time. And who is she to say? Because we can't think um, a person is, is not think an irrational person is not thinking rationally. <laughs> So we can't rationalize with those who are perpetrating abuse. There has to be a different approach and a different system that happens, that holds them accountable, that really doesn't include the police. You can Google it. This is what I'm now I'm telling you to Google it. You can Google so many people who have... Um, you know, gone to, to help and break up fights or whatever, and they end up dying. There was a, a teenager, I think, recently who was breaking up a, a fight between uh, a couple, her friend and her, her boyfriend, and she ended up getting killed. A while ago, there was a, a brother who, you know, pulled over, saw this man, you know, abusing this woman, and he ended up being killed. So we got to be wise we got to be communal. 
We got to share information because not every situation is going to be handled the same. So with that, I hope that you will reflect and meditate and just think about what can I do to stop this epidemic? What can I do to help save the lives of those who are in abusive relationships? And how can I build community so that this can end and people can stop dying, um, mind, body, and spirit? Um, due to domestic violence. So we will stop the violence when we end the silence. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. I hope this was helpful. I hope that there were some takeaways. I hope you have a new language about addressing domestic violence. Um... I hope that there you leave here with a level of discernment because I want you to be safe and I want you to be well. I want you to use the domestic domestic violence hotline as a resource, um, not only for you, but for those who are in intimate partner or domestic violent relationships. And I want you to love, I want you to love more than enough. Love yourself and love others beyond measure, without judgment. Uh, yes, Marcia, don't forget prayer. Prayer changes things. Prayer truly changes things. I'm a living testimony between domestic violence and surviving metastatic breast cancer. It's nothing short of a miracle. <laughs> it's because of prayer. It's because of community. It's because somebody spoke my name. Someone just had me on their mind. Someone just lifted their hands. Someone did ritual. Someone did the work to help me and to journey with me. So it's the same with domestic violence, except there's a different level of risk that we must keep at the forefront of our minds and our hearts. So keep the divine in you at the forefront so that the, the divine can lead you accordingly. And when you pray, it's not always a, a formal prayer. Sometimes it is speaking someone's name. Sometimes it is sitting in silence and waiting to hear a word from the Lord. Sometimes it's lamenting. It's your tears. Your tears are prayers. Your moans are prayers. So thank you, Reverend Marcia, for inserting that into this, this narrative as we, we close this episode. But I thank you so much, and I hope that we will continue to journey together this month. Again, share this, invite people to come, invite people to watch, invite people to listen on any of your podcast platforms. You can catch it on YouTube, you can catch it on Instagram, you can catch it on Facebook. It is everywhere. So I hope that we can do uh, a continuation of this conversation on next Tuesday. I love you to the moon and beyond. I see you and I thank you for journeying with me as we build community one womanist episode at a time. I am Dr. Tad, your host and curator for Tuesdays with Tawana. And I love you, and I will see you next week. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Let's stop the violence and end the silence. I'm out.